Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Once again, we're doing our uh, bi-monthly RDA tech Q&A stream with me, Mike Gearman. Many um, years of technology experience. I have many years working in IT and doing other things with electronics that probably I should be dead over, but, you know. Um, Can you tell different levels of voltage by touching? Yes! Man, y y so can one of my coworkers. Oh, that's one ten. That's two twenty. <laughs> Nothing quite wakes you up in the morning like hitting the live wire. People will swear by like Starbucks and shit. No, he can definitely tell the sixty hertz from four hundred hertz. <laughs> it's like that guy in that in the great outdoors kept getting hit by lightning over and over again. Could tell the weather. <laughs> Same damn thing. Um, we are taking your questions here. Uh, we've got some for tonight, but we may have we may have time to take some more. If you'd like to uh, ask us some questions here, got some technical issues you may need some assistance with, send it to request at radiodeadair.com. Put tech QA in the cup. Put tech QA in the subject line. We will attempt to assist you with it. I'm not very good with the words. <laughs> happens. I fail mouth. Uh, so, uh, we're, we're looking a little bit at some of the, uh, the, the news that has come by. It's been relatively kind of quiet out there, which in and of itself is a little un unsettling. Um, last time we talked about Comcast rolling out their uh, their cable caps, their data caps. Don't call it a data cap. It's been there for years. No. Um, <laughs> do you like that one? That was good. That was good. Um, they, they, you, we should see if we should get... Who was it? Was, was that... Um, don't call it a comeback. I just lost his name. I he did does, too. Uh, he does a uh, um, lip sync contest. He does... He's on... Uh, NCIS Los Angeles. What's his name? I don't know. LL Cool J. LL Cool J. We should see if we can get LL Cool J now to record. Don't call it a data cap. It's been here for years. No, that's that was that was more James Brown than LL Cool J. Well, I'm very white, so forgive me. And um, they're neither. Neither of them are. Exactly. So I fucked it up. Um, well. It's it, it, for those of you just catching us. Uh, what Comcast rolled out was uh, if you go over 300 gigabytes a month, you have to pay ten dollars for every 50 gigabytes you go over, or you could just upfront pay them an additional thirty dollars for the unlimited service that you had beforehand. Now it's kind of like now, I did have a question for that about that. I didn't think of. Uh, uh, last week until after the show was over. So 300 gigabytes and then $10 for 50. So say, I, say I've done 300, I go 300 here one, they go, okay, that's an extra 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. I go to 350 one, it's another extra 10 bucks. Yeah. I go to 401, that's a third $10, but do I now switch over to unlimited because I paid them $30? Probably not, because you didn't, you didn't subscribe to the unlimited it, thing. It's probably, I have to not pay an additional $30 to go to unlimited, even though I've already paid $30. Yeah. They're wonderful folks, Comcast. I was going to say assholes, but it sounds sarcastic. <laughs> well, on and for we, it has nothing to do with congestion. It's entirely um, based on. They don't want to upgrade their stuff. Well, that and it's a profit engine for it, and we had even more evidence of that because Comcast has revealed. Their next step in the diabolical plan, there's there's no other definition for it. Okay, um, what's that? They're launching their own streaming TV service. Oh yeah, I saw that. And it does not count against that 300 gigabyte cap per month. Yeah, yeah, that's not surprising. Now how this- Show of hands, who was surprised? Yeah. <laughs> How this is going to work out is you pay it, you pay $15 a month if you don't have cable TV and you get access to streaming cable TV. TV. Yeah. Over the internet, which does not cost you anything extra. 
question. Yeah. Isn't this very similar to what that company in New York was doing where they said, well, you got a little tiny antenna, we sell you? Yes, except Comcast actually got all the rights to do it this time. Okay. So. Fair enough. But in this instance, not only is it does not count against your data caps to use their streaming service, but it also doesn't matter what internet speed tier you have. It'll work at the fastest one anyway. So you could be paying for slow as hell internet speed for playing World of Warcraft. Right. Or whatever. You, you, you go, I, I just surf the web. I need slow, slow ass speed. Right. I'm watching TV. I'm up here. Yeah. For their service. Now, this tells us quite a few things to begin with. Number one, congestion is not a fucking issue. No. At all. Well, hold on. Hold on. Congestion <clears throat> is not, I would say, is not the main issue. I suspect that if they had a bunch of people, I mean, and a lot of people in the same area doing this all together, there would be some congestion issues, and then they'd go, oh, shit. Maybe. But I'm kind of leading toward no on that. I just That's my gut reaction considering their behavior. Now, I'll, the first thing everybody is, is coming up with is saying, well, doesn't this fall afoul of net neutrality? Not necessarily. Be, well, you know, what they claim and how it actually works, all right, how, how they're doing this is, Comcast is claiming since they're using their own private IPs, since it's their own IP address within Comcast network, it does not count as the internet. Oh, because it's all internal to Comcast. Right. Not going out. And therefore, since it's not part of the public internet, since Comcast is using their own network, then it's not a net neutrality issue of Comcast putting the data caps on for everything but their service because, you know, they, they're they using their own private network. Now, given that that network is in fact connected to the internet, it's just blocked off with some software blocking. Um, that's kind of bullshit. Yeah, no. That, that I, It's very much bullshit, actually. I wouldn't say kind of bullshit. It's kind of bullshit. Be, uh, uh, no, I can't give you a ride to the airport. Uh, uh, I've got things to do. That's kind of bullshit. <laughs> this is actually... This is major league bullshit. Yeah, it's... It's... Their way of trying to wiggle around using, you know, number one, the uh, ignorance of people on how the internet actually works, and number two, trying to loophole their way through net neutrality. Now, this, this is, I mean, uh, when J Jessica Jones just came out. Yeah. Big fucking deal. Netflix. Only place you can see it. Netflix. I watched the hell out of that series. Loved it. Not, not, not the greatest one. Really good. Still, now, if Comcast could offer me Netflix's content on their $15 a month streaming thing, I might be, you know, tempted, but they can't. All they're offering is the same networks that I stopped watching when I got rid of my cable service. So not only is this kind of anti-competitive bullshit that wiggle room, da, weasel word, lawyery crap. Not only is it all of that, it's not even very good. What what they're what they're putting them what they're putting us through for this shit. You know this. I think it's I think it's more for the cord cutters to go. I would pay fifteen dollars a month for two or three shows that I watch regularly. Yeah, maybe. But if this is like for basic TV. I would say it would depend on what channels are in the bundle. Eh, ESPN won't. They can't. 
because ESPN has very specific fucking rules about all that shit. Oh, yeah, but I don't know anyone who watches ESPN. <laughs> yeah, but ESPN is I've the... Never, I've never met anyone <laughs> who said they've watched ESPN. I mean, it may not, they, I, I may be surrounded by them. It just doesn't come up. ESPN is the biggest fuck you pay me of all the cable companies. There. Yeah, they've got, you've got, when you get ESPN, you've got to take two or three other channels with it. Mm-hmm. They, they are, they, they force it. They, they are getting subsidized by other channels due to the way the packages work. It's, it is definitely, they are the biggest fuck you pay me. So they're not going to be on, I probably promise you, mainly because I'm willing to bet they're trying to set up their own streaming service at some point, like HBO did, to get their own money. Yeah, but see, the difference between Comcast and HBO. Okay, so what? Comcast owns what? NBC? Yes. Okay, or NBC owns Comcast. I don't remember which. Um, so HBO sets up a streaming service. They've got the HBO library. They've got a big set of stuff that they've mm-hmm. historically done. Mm-hmm. NBC sets up their own thing. What are they going to have? They're going to have, what, 20 years of Law & Order? <laughs> That was NBC, right? Yeah. I mean, sure, it would, it would, you know, it would add to the cargo cult of Lenny Briscoe. <laughs> but it, what are they going to offer? I mean, it, the, the, that new Star Wars show, uh, Star, Wars, Star Trek show that's coming out. CBS. The first episode. Yeah, CBS. They're going to put the first episode on TV, but the rest of them are going to be on a streaming service. That you have to pay for. That you have to pay for. I'm like... I bet this thing's going to get really low ratings. All the Trekkies are going to go, uh, no, fuck you. I'll wait till you put it out on CD or DVD. Yeah, they'll buy the D- they'll buy the DVD or they'll stream it through less than legal means because they're Trekkies and they're smart. Okay, some of them, yes. <laughs> Man, you, I, I, every damn Trekkie I've ever met could fucking rewire my entire home network with a fucking firewall and, you know, make it so my front door would play the fucking t- tra- noise that the do- doors on the show make. And Sorry, it reminds me of the uh, second airplane movie with, with Shatner on the moon base. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, this, this, this is definitely going to come up with the FCC, I feel. This is going to be an issue. And I'm so... Yeah, but it all depends on when it gets there, how many... How many Republicans versus how many Democrats are on that? On the yeah, we'll have to see what happens in the election next year. Uh, yeah. Well, speaking of cable, and in this case, cable modems, um, if you're using a cable service to watch the internet right now, um, I would advise you all to go over to that little box you got from the cable company, the cable modem, and see if it says the word Aris on it. A-R-R-I-S. Because if it does... Hit it with a hammer. Well, actually, yeah, that might not be a bad idea. Um, Well, it depends on if you're renting it or not. (laughs) RS cable modems seem to have a little bit of a problem. Uh, Tom's Hardware is reporting that uh, security researchers have uncovered not one, but two back doors in some RS cable modems. Uh, Over half a million cable customers are affected by this, uh, including Comcast, Time Warner Cable, Charter, and Cox. Firmware of the cable modems in question came with an undocumented uh, libraris underscore password dot SO, it's Linux stuff, library that acted as a backdoor by allowing privileged account logins with a different custom password for each day of the year. Backdoor actually dates to 2009, but RS never fixed it. Because that would be hard. Oh, never. All right. I, I do admit I like the different custom password for every day of the year. That, that's a nice, that makes it a little less obvious. So it's a nice touch. Still, never, never, ever. Never, ever, never, 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 ever, 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 never, ever, ever put a back door into your product. Well, to be fair, they might not have known they were putting it in there initially. 
It depends on how smart your people were. Yes. I mean, they were selling to Comcast, so they didn't have to be too bright. Well, regardless, never do this. A backdoor in anything is a fucking security vulnerability. Oh, yes. Plain absolutely. and simple. No matter what your intention to begin with, putting this in there is dangerous, especially, especially for a cable modem. Oh, yeah. Because that there's generally nothing between the cable modem and, and book. Anyone can get in that line but uh, and then into your cable modem and then into your network. Mm -hmm. And the only thing between you and them would be then your firewalls that you may or may not have um, and your antivirus, anti-malware, anti-intrusion stuff. And just the nastiness that can be... Per can you imagine cable modems? Modems themselves, not... Not even routers, but modems themselves turned into a zombie botnet. Holy shit. That's nasty as fuck. Because normally the end user does not have access to configure or adjust or get to any sort of access inside of the cable modem. Your router, sure. You can configure your router backwards, forwards, upwards, upside down, all that stuff. But you as a customer, even me, I own my modem. Mine's a Motorola. I own it. But there's no interface for me to go into my Motorola router, not a direct easy one that I can access with my computer, to adjust it or change it. All of that's normally done on the side of the cable company. Yeah, because you have to give them the IP address and everything, or the, not the, the MAC address of the right. device, so they can identify and go, Yes, we will allow this on our network. Yeah. The, the, you, in fact, with uh, a lot of these modems and whatnot, the firmware and whatnot, it gets pushed out from the cable company. You can't yeah, so, update it yourself if, if there yeah, needs so to be. Even if there's an update, you can go, well, I wonder if I have the update yet. And you'll be still wondering six months later. You'll never know. You, you have no way of, of accessing it. Now, there is supposedly a fix on the way for this, but it's going to have to go through... Comcast and Time Warner and Charter and Cox, all of them are going to have to push out the fix to uh, Six saying, I'm going to sound kind of ignorant right now, but what does it mean when a modem has a back door? Well, a modem is a computer. It's, it's, it's a tiny, small little computer that's got one specific function, but it is a computer. To be able to access a computer, it means that modem's connected to your network, that modem's connected to your computer, that modem can get, someone could use that modem to access your computer. Yep. Or someone can use that modem to act as a zombie for DDoS attacks. Or man in the middle and get all your credit card information. Oh, God, nah, that's nasty. That's nasty. Now, now you're probably going to have been on a website that was, you know, encrypting things but so that might not be too bad but so possible yeah so in any event if you happen to own an rs cable modem be aware of this 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 is a big one this is you know you might not it's it's not what they consider a sexy tech issue you might not hear a bunch about it but this is damn stupid this is just never leave a backdoor access into any consumer electronic product. Never fucking, never leave it in any product. Backdoors should never be in anything that's in anyone else's hands but your own. It should never be for public consumption. It should never be put into access to, you know, because it can go anywhere. Once a backdoor is in there, that's a security exploit. Uh, I hate when they do that. So, uh, a little bit of making everyone feel old. Um, Windows 1.0. Oh, God. Who's using that? Just celebrated its 30th anniversary. Oh, that's fine. Okay. It's, it's, not a, it's not a 
French uh, airport using Windows 1.0. That's yeah, I was I was going to mention that. Yeah, I was mentioning that Windows 1.0 is 30 years old. Windows 3.1 is about what 25 years old. Oh, I don't think. Yeah, 25. Yeah, uh, 1992 is when uh, Windows 3.1 came out. Well, <sighs> Paris Airport, Paris Orly Airport. Uh, I'm probably saying that wrong because I'm a filthy American. Um, the airport had to close. Uh, earlier in November, after a failure of a system running Windows 3.1 left it unable to operate in a fog. They use a system called Decor to communicate runway visual range to pilot in poor weather conditions uh, like the fog experience. This system is essential. It stopped working and the airport struggled to find out why. The tools used by airport controllers run on four different operating systems that are all between 10 and 20 years old, Windows 3.1 being joined by Windows XP and unspecified Unix systems. Um, systems are poorly maintained as well. Moreover the, moreover, the age of these systems mean that it's hard to find staff who can work with them. Oh, yeah. It's like trying to find people who, who understand COBOL. One of them's retiring next year, and they haven't found anyone to replace him. You know, if I knew Windows 3.1, I'd be like, uh, I can learn French. <laughs> or I can just speak English really loudly until you understand. Windows, people are people in the channel are saying, stop buying, stop using Windows 3.1. Well, here's the thing. Um, not always possible. Not always possible. Because finding new software to do what the old software did not always something that happens. Yeah, it might have been. It might have been uh, uh, written in house, you know, custom stuff. And they, I've I've run into this before. We the place I've worked had custom software written in house that they lost the source code to. So they for forever. Yeah. So they were forever cobbling together equipment to keep the old system running, to keep this old software going. Uh, because they didn't have the time or the money to rewrite it from scratch, or the in-house knowledge the guy who wrote it, wrote it had left. In 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 addition, I mean, well, for for the longest time, and I say this as a guitar guy, this is this is one of those little quirks of musical history. Um, for the longest time, if you played guitar and used a tube amplifier, one of the best places to get really good audio tubes. Yeah. Military surplus. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because long after consumer products like radios and television stuff stopped using vacuum tubes in electronics, the military was still using them because... Oh, yeah, because it was, it was, they were, they were you know, able to handle like G-forces and things like that better. Uh, they were able to, in theory, they were more resistant to, say, a, a, an EM burst. In theory. In theory. Um, I say, uh, that's what I've read at least. But um, more, it's, it, yeah, it was it was great stuff. I mean, you know, you could go to if you had a military base nearby, you'd find out when they're auctioning off stuff. You'd have to buy a pallet of stuff at a time, but you know, you might get some neat stuff. Well, more than that, it was the cost of replacing all of those radio and transmission systems on all of those ships, on all of those bases, on all of those things was simply staggering. Oh yeah, absolutely. That, that it was easier for the military to keep using vacuum tubes than to upgrade all their shit. And in this case, like for, for the Paris airport, it was easier for them to keep using Windows 3.1 then to upgrade it. Now, that kind of says a lot about how our technology systems are set up. When just the, the idea of modernizing is so ridiculously cost prohibitive that it can lead to critical systems like say air traffic control being left at the mercy of Windows 3.1. Oh, Windows 3.1, when it crashed, you didn't get the blue screen. I don't remember 
Look what you got. You got the DOS prompt! Oh, yeah. Because when Windows 3.1 gave up, it's like, fuck you, it went back to MS-DOS. And if you were running stuff straight from the DOS prompt, you might not notice it was crashed for a while, because, oh, I've crashed from the DOS prompt to a DOS prompt. It's over here in the background. Oh. No. It has to work. I don't know, I guess it crashed. <laughs> Yeah, who, who the hell knows? I mean, it, it was probably a case of, I say, probably a case of budgetary issues, or just oh, it's not some some. I've run into this so many times. Some executive management type saying, "Well, it's not broken. Why, why should I pay money to upgrade it?" Ex yeah, oh, I hate that. I fuck. I've worked in so many companies that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. This shit does not run forever. You know, it's it's not it's not like Fallout, where a nuclear war happens and 200 years later you can still hack into a Unix terminal. No, 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 that's not what's going to happen. This shit will break. I uh, and Windows 3.1. Holy crap! What fucking computer is running that? I couldn't even, I don't think I could even buy hardware that would run that anymore. Yeah, I mean, you to, to, I, to get the drivers, to get the Windows 3.1, I don't think it recognizes a PC. Would it recognize PCIe? I don't think it would. No, I don't think it would. Would it recognize the, the bus system? Would it recognize, would it even recognize the CPU? I don't know. I don't think it would run anything better than a 386. Three, yeah, 486 or whatnot, because I that was back in the ISA, VESA days for uh -huh. the bus systems. I bet you can still find some of that crap on eBay. Yeah, so that's not going to fucking run forever. Because even, even these days, if you run Windows 3.1 on a virtual machine, that machine is pretending to be a computer that no longer fucking exists. Well, they do sell them on eBay. I mean, eBay, it turns out, has a vintage computing section. I remember when the Hubble broke. And they had to replace the processor on it. It was a 46. Yeah, yeah. The Hubble still runs a 46 processor. And they were so lucky they had a backup unit to send up there. Because There's it, a, a thing where NASA was looking to hire someone who had experience with writing code on on assembly, you know, writing code assembly where you've only got 32 uh, meg of memory or whatever, or a really small amount of memory, you know, really tight code, because they occasionally they send very minor program updates out to Voyager. And their guy was retiring. And so they they went, uh, we need this. Holy crap. Does anyone in the world still have these skills? Shit. Eventually, you won't be able to fucking talk to it anymore. Won't that be so sad? You know, in a hundred years, Voyager will still be out there sending us broadcasts and we just can't... No one will know how the fuck to say shit to it. We're going to have aliens who will find Voyager. They will decode the technology. They will figure out how to speak to it. And then they'll arrive here hundreds of years later and with all this obsolete shit that try to communicate with us, we'll be like, what is this strange method of communication they're attempting to use? That's going to be weird. So. Okay, so. We are. I just found a, uh, a DOS 6.22 Win 3 1 mini computer on eBay. $44. $44. That's a deal right there. We should sell it to the French. <laughs> Got all your problems solved right here, guys. Airport's going to be fine. Merca. All right. So time to get some of our questions. Um, sure. First one comes from Elliot. He says, I was hoping to get some advice on what to do about upgrading my computer. Basically, I want to play Fallout 4. Yes. Uh, my computer currently cannot do this. Don't have a lot of money, and I'm not looking to play Fallout 4 on Mac settings. 
I'd be fine to play in the lowest settings available as long as it actually helps me play the game. Here are my computer specs as far as I can tell. It's running an AMD A4 3420 APU, uh, 8 gigs of RAM, and running Windows 8. And he gives it with Radeon HD graphics. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that the, there's your problem right well, there. Well, okay, there's two problems here that I see. Huh. One, the CPU, I, I looked at the minimum specs for uh, Fallout 4 in preparation for this question. Mm -hmm. And the CPU falls a little under what they say is the minimum specs. But unless the computer, unless the software is actually checking for that, it might still be okay. Yeah, that, that. It's it's actually, uh, what are we talking about here? Okay, so the minimum specs for that, uh, just keeping in the AMD family, uh, was an AMD Phenom Two X Four Nine uh, Nine Four Five. And I want to point out the Phenom Two is an older processor than the AMD A Four Thirty Four Twenty. This is how badly AMD has fucked up their processors over the years. The Phenom 2 X2, th th that, that is an, that is like four years older and can still run Fallout 4, but their newer fucking processor cannot. It, yes, it's, it, it's, it's only a hair below it, mind you. It's not, it's not that bad. That's just sad, though. Uh, the... Actually, maybe I'm reading this wrong. Maybe it is. Uh, it is better, but um, it. I. To be fair, I don't know. I don't know AMD well enough to go. Yeah, this will run. This won't run. But I think it will. It's the video card that's really your bottleneck. Yeah. Well, it's that's an APU, which is their fancy way of saying a CPU and a graphics processor built together. Yeah. It's onboard integrated graphics, and that's always the Bad. yeah. Well, when it comes to gaming. No, it's just not not a functioning option. Now I looked up uh, the processor myself. It's an FM1 slot processor okay. from AMD, which means upgrading the processor is not an option unless you want to eBay it. And I would, unless you really know what you're doing, I would never recommend eBaying a used CPU. Yeah, that's that. If, this is that. That's always looking at a used CPU. And there's no way of knowing what issues that thing might have or where it came from or what it's 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 not a good bet. Not unless you're desperate, not unless you're looking for old technology that no longer fucking exists. Hi, Paris. Um, poorly, poorly. Yeah. Um, now, so updating the CPU is is not an option here. It's not a good option. Uh, so I, what I don't know about APUs hmm. is. Can we can we slap a separate video card in there and run video off the separate video card? If it has a PCI slot, then yes. Okay, so that's your option right there. Then. Yeah. It, now, unfortunately, you, what you, Elliot, what you didn't tell us about this computer was: is this a desktop? Is this a laptop? I'm going to go ahead and assume it's a desktop, given the uh, A4 3420 seems to be a desktop CPU. Um, in which case. Your your pro your best bet is to get a video card. Um, now when you say well, first thing first, yeah, look at the spec on your motherboard. Right. Because the one thing you don't want to do is go out and go. I'm gonna buy a PCI 16 or PCI Express or PCI whatever. That doesn't work on your your motherboard. Then you're just making multiple trips back and forth. So from your from your documentation for your uh, motherboard. Look to see what slots you have available. Crack the case if you gotta. Check to see what's what's there, and uh, go with a video card that will fit an available slot. Hopefully, you have one. If you don't, uh, I don't know of a good solution for you that is as inexpensive as you to you indicate. Um, in this case, your your best option I would recommend if you're really tight on money. Just to get the game playing, like you said, you don't need it at the highest settings if you want to play it like 720 or something. I would go with a GeForce GTX 950. That's going to set you back about $150, depending on where you get it from. Um, lots of different manufacturers. All of them are going to be about the same. I would go with maybe EVA, MSI, or Gigabyte. 
but uh, or even Asus. Asus might not be a bad one either, but the 950 is probably your bare minimum to go for to get this game playable for you. Also, I'd recommend the 950 because it's not going to need you to get um, any sort of power supply upgrade. Which is a very good one. Yeah, the 950 doesn't need any plug-in extra power connectors. It's just you, you put the card in the slot and you go. It's as simple as that. So you're not going to have to make any adjustments to... You're not going to have to buy any other components to make it work. All you'll need is to just get the card, which will won't set you back quite as much. Um, you're not going to be able to play it. You might be able to do 1080p, but just not have, you know, the fastest settings. You'll have to set, set the graphics down a little bit. But you will be able to play it. Now, with the processor you've listed, which I, I put that into CPU Boss, which is a great site that allows you to compare hardware against each other. It seems to rank just under an i3. Ooh. Which is kind of sad. Because uh, they're saying uh, i5, I think. Or... It should work, but expect your loading screens to take a while. Uh, the other thing to do, uh, and this is just a, a check, because you didn't say, are you running 64-bit OS? I mean, I think you said you were running... Did you say you were running... What OS did you say you were running? He said Windows 8. Windows 8, which doesn't have a 32-bit, right? I don't think so. Okay, so as long as you're running a 64-bit OS, because if you're running 32-bit, all that's not going to work. Yeah. Period. End of story. Doesn't. But, yeah, you should be... You should. All you need is a GT, uh, GeForce GTX 950. I wouldn't recommend going with NVIDIA because those normally require power adapters and what. This is just the simplest option... For 150, it's not cheap by, you know, it's not, but it's not the most expensive one. Uh, if you can push it a little bit toward the 960, I believe there are some that don't require external power. And those are, that's about $200. But your, your, nine, your 950 should be all you really need to get you. If you're just worried about, you just want to play the game. You're not worried about the fastest and the best. You just want it to play. You should be fine with the GTX 950. And of course, when you got the case cracked open, blow out the dust. <laughs> Always blow your computer. Just don't use a vacuum cleaner. Anyway, uh, next one comes from Miguel. This is another person trying to get a little out of a lot here. I have a question regarding cache memory video card, cache memory cards. I have an Acer Aspire One. With two gigabytes of RAM, running Windows 8.1. Been looking online for expansion cards since my netbook has too many PCIe slots. Been seeing these on eBay for cache memory cards that boast Intel Turbo memory or Intel Turbo cache. Uh, tried to do some research, found a lot of mixed messages. Some sites may, may say it makes your performance worse. Some saying otherwise. I have two questions. Do you know anything about Intel Turbo memory and if it's worth getting on an expansion card with said feature? If it is not, would be it be more efficient to get a dedicated mini PCIe cache memory card in the first place? Or would getting a discrete USB flash drive and setting it for ready boost work just as well? In case it makes a difference or not, my CPU is a 1.6 gigahertz Intel Atom N450. Okay, Miguel. Nothing you recommending is going to make this thing any better. Nothing. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see it happening. Now. The, the, the memory cache cards, all these other things you're looking at, all those will do is expand the amount of access of accessible memory. Now, okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to explain, break down real briefly why people say if you want your computer to go faster, add memory. Here's how your computer works. You have your CPU. That's essentially the brain. That's how it does all the things it does. But a brain needs a place to hold memories in order to access those so it can think. That's what RAM is for. 
Random access memory, those sticks that go in there. RAM is the first type of memory. Consider RAM, and this, this is very broad sort of allegorical terms, consider RAM to be short-term memory. RAM is very, very fast. It can work about the same speed as the CPU. So information goes back and forth from RAM to the CPU at a very high rate. It can access it quickly. Good. But the problem with RAM is when you turn off your computer, everything in RAM goes away. It requires a constant electricity to keep information stored in it. So, and while you can get it, these days you can get a whole lot of RAM. There are systems that can handle up to 128 gigabytes of RAM. While you can get a whole bunch of it, once the power goes off, it all goes blank. That's what the hard drive is for. Hard drive you can think of, and again, broad allegory, hard drive is long-term memory. A hard drive can hold a whole lot of information, and when you turn off the power, it stays on the hard drive. But it's slow as shit. It cannot talk to the processor very quickly. So the way a computer works is information is copied off the hard drive into RAM so it can speak to the processor at the same speed the processor works. Now, why people say if you want to speed up a computer, add RAM, adding RAM gives you more space to copy more information from the hard drive so it can speak to the processor faster. So it has to swap stuff out less often. Right. If it has more room there, it doesn't have to copy back and forth as much. It has more room to work. That makes your computer work faster. To a certain point. Unfortunately, in this case, we're talking about an Intel Atom processor. This is about as budget as budget can be. This is, these were the beating hearts of, of uh, netbooks back when the big netbook boom happened for like two or three years there. Um, they work, but they if you add more RAM to this, it's like you're giving more, more memory, more, more information to a stupid person. They'll eventually be able to figure it out, but they're not. If you give them more space, they're still gonna go. They're still gonna go stupid speed. Yeah, it's like it's like putting um, a, a spoiler on uh, one of those little motor uh, motorized skateboard things. <laughs> it 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 may look neat, but it you're not getting a performance out of it. It's not gonna really make things go any faster. Yeah. Memory, adding additional memory to an atom processor is just a painting go faster stripes on the side of your car. Yeah. They look cool, but it's not doing it. Yeah, th this, this is kind of a Hail Mary, and it's not going to result in a touchdown for you, Mikhail. I'm sorry to say. You really should just get rid of it. Because... <laughs> Upgrade. 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 Don't, don't say get rid of it. He, he may have some federal value tied up in this. Yeah, because in this case... The, the the amount of time and money you would spend trying to find workarounds to make this little netbook perform faster, you you'd be better off with a three hundred dollar laptop. You really would. It it would a brand new three hundred dollar laptop is going to beat the pants off your little netbook. Um, in fact, I believe HP is offering something. It was like two hundred dollars. Why I check? They're not very big. I think they're eleven inch screens. They're in. They're kind of in network netbook category. Only they have newer processors in them. They're not. They're like i three processors. Not the fastest thing, but heads and shoulders above an Intel Atom. Yeah. So yeah, your best bet in this case, let the netbook go. It was a fad. It was a bad fad. Let it go. Just let the netbook go. Let it go. Okay, uh, next question comes from uh, K. Culp uh, saying, I have a question about Ethernet driver settings. 
Uh, bought the Asus router that you recommended, served me well. However, after a recent Windows 10 update, a huge one it seems, my towers had slower internet, directly wiring using Cat5e Ethernet to and from the modem and to and from the router. My motherboard is an Asus Republic of Gaming Maximus uh, 7 Hero, and the Ethernet is Intel Gigabit Ethernet driver. Why does my Ethernet slow down every time Windows 10 updates, and is there any way I can fix this? Um, well, all right, first off, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by, uh, did, was it slowing down just because when the, the update was happening? Or after the update, you're getting noticeably slower performance. I'm going to assume it's the latter in this case, because... What likely happened during that update, and I can't confirm this, but it's my best guess, is a new driver, a new generic Windows driver, was pushed out for your internet, for your Intel Gigabit adapter. Awesome. The problem has been, there's always been this weird-ass disconnect between Intel's drivers they offer themselves and the Intel driver that comes through Windows Update. I have never, ever, fu every fucking time. I have, with my, this happens with my laptop a lot because my laptop's, uses most Intel graphics. It's it's just, you know, it's my general workbook. Every fucking time an Intel driver gets pushed down through Windows Update, everything goes to hell. What I end up having to do is go to Intel's website and get their driver from their website and install that. And suddenly, everything fucking works relatively normally again. Mostly. Sometimes, one time, I actually had to install a six-month-old driver because the new one actually made shit worse. Intel does... Intel... Oh, God almighty. Intel is, is just... The shit is... Their drivers are such a tremendous pain in the butt. I would honestly recommend your, your best bet for this one would be go to Intel's website and get whatever driver is available for, uh, or, or Asus would also have it as well. Go to Asus's website. You're probably gonna get a decently updated one there as well. Get the driver directly from them likely is going to sort out the issue for you. You cannot, this is why the mandatory Windows Update thing in Windows 10 is driving me nuts, because it's going to cause these issues for people who are not going to know any better. Across the industry, across the board, this is one you're not going to be able to fix until you can get the manufacturers themselves to fix their shit. Because Windows gets their drives from the manufacturer, and for some reason, there's some disconnect. And, uh, so, my recommendation, yeah, go, go to Intel's website, go to Asus's website, and run from there. Do you have anything to add, Mike? Uh, it's just basically the same thing. Uh, Intel's not the only provider of, of drivers. Uh, it happens with Realtek and a few others as well. Oh, fuck, Realtek audio. Ugh! Oh, Realtek makes... Uh, uh, Ethernet drivers as well. Yeah, yeah. It's fucking... So fucking frustrating. All right, we have one last one from David tonight. Uh, my parents got a new machine. Is there any software I can use to move the installed apps they use from my old hard drive to the new one? Or am I stuck reinstalling all the software manually? Um, okay, yes, there is most of the time it doesn't work very well there's uh what's it called win move or pc move or something like that i forget what the name was. i just yeah um uh altris was it altris i i think that was them made a, a product called move anything or something like that yeah um and uh the problem is the uh uh, 
was the software out there these days puts a lot of stuff in a lot of places and doesn't always have configuration files or uh, registry entries that says, this is where this is, look here, it might be built into the code, whatever. So when you move stuff, you're at a, uh, a possibility of not moving everything. This is, you know, I give Mac, I'm not a big fan of Apple's hardware, but I will give them credit when it comes to the Mac OS. The, you know how you move software from one Mac to another? Installed software? No. You copy the folder. Boom! That's it. It fucking works. The best way to describe what's going on here is with, with Mac OS, you're in a very orderly office where every folder is in a very, is in a separate neat place. It's all easily identified. It's all perfectly modular. You can move one thing from another place. No one has any trouble finding anything. It's all very nicely organized. Windows, it's like, have you ever walked into somebody's office and their inbox was like this fucking high and <laughs> their folders on stacked on their desk, their folders stacked on top of the file cabinets themselves. And when you try to say, look, maybe you should organize them, they'll tell you, hey, look, I know where everything is, okay? I have a system and it works just fine. That's Windows. Uh, ba a basic breakdown here of what goes on. Windows has doesn't just have a file folder that the, fo the files for your software go into. It's not just like, you know, it's installed to this folder and this is where everything is. No. Windows has something that's a legacy all the way back to, I want to say, it's beyond, it's Windows 3. Point. Didn't Windows 3.1 have the registry? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a legacy that goes back decades. The Windows registry. Every time you install software or make changes to Windows or add or do anything in Windows, Windows keeps a tally of it in a file called the Windows registry. The Windows registry tells Windows where programs are, uh, what, pro what files are needed, what DirectX stuff is attached to it, what hardware might work, how, where your drivers are. The registry is the key to everything in Windows. They used to put the, all of this stuff in, in what's, what's called INI files. Yeah, they stopped doing that. It all goes yeah, in the registry. For the most part, yeah. It all goes in the fucking registry now. And, and the main reason they switched, uh, most places switched from INI files to the registry is because it made it much harder, although by no means impossible, people to um, steal software. Yeah. Because they go, oh, you just edit, here's the INA file, I'll just edit it, done. Ah. It's in the registry, you go, well, where the hell was it? Where yes. the hell did it put the thing? Without your specific registry, from your specific computer, simply copying files from one system to another, will you will not be able to run that program because Windows will try to open it. It will look in the registry for all the information necessary and it won't find it on that new computer. It will go, what the hell is this? And it will turn return an error when you try to run that software. Now, what Mike mentioned was these programs like Move Anything and PC Mover and Move Your Butt and all of these software that started coming out around the era of Windows XP when people wanted to upgrade from Windows 98, but they wanted to keep all their software moved in the new system. So all these companies said, hey, we'll let you do that. And none of them, not a one, not even the one that's built into Microsoft's own software has ever really worked 100%. In so fact, one built into Microsoft's own software. Well, the one built Microsoft has is it'll migrate your settings and your documents and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, Windows Easy Transfer it doesn't it doesn't move. But out. it doesn't do applications. None of these, all of these softwares promise we'll move your shit over and it'll be a okay. And it tried to move shit over and it was never a okay because none of them really worked consistently or well with every single type of software out there. 
Yeah. And another thing to, to worry about with this is some software, I don't mean software, might, not even most, but some software, uh, the licensing on it is tied specifically to the first computer you install it. And to install it on a new computer, even to transfer it to a new computer, you either have to contact them and unlicense it on the old one and relicense it on the new one, if they allow you even to do that. Adobe or, used to do that, yeah. Yeah. Or you have to buy a new one because they won't let you do that. The more professional a company is, and I am going to say it that way, the more likely they are to let you transfer stuff over. They yeah. might not make it easy, but it'll be doable. Yeah. And when I say professional, I, I'm referring to software that's costing thousands of dollars per license rather than a couple hundred. Yeah. Well, in, in any event, what this long-winded explanation here was is short version you're going to have to install everything yourself again i'm sorry there are you now you could possibly keep your old settings if you're willing to spend a whole lot of time going through your user data folders uh your local was app data in, in local local if you're willing to look up for each, I can't, I would love to tell you step by step how to do it, but it kind of varies from software to software. I've had to do this with my own Premiere Pro when I've had to move it to another, to when I had to reinstall my operating system. I had to copy those settings to keep my settings files. It varies from software to software, what gets stored in there and how. Sadly, you're just likely just going to have to. the easiest, less headache inducing thing is to start over. That transfer software never works reliably in my experience. I am very sorry. You are stuck reinstalling everything. Yay! Fucking Windows! Ugh, fucking Windows.